All right, well, thank you for uh, joining us for the September edition of the Kentucky K-12 CIO EdTech Leaders um, Monthly Meeting. I'm David Couch with the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, joining us uh, today uh, by teams are all of our district CIOs and EdTech leaders. And then by the KD's media portal, we also have our variety of CATS partners, and those can be um, uh, state agencies or, or vendor partners and our, our co-op directors, our educational co-op directors, anyone else that wanted to join. So uh, we have we have two methods that we're broadcasting this. So this is the audience. And so um, this is our way to share some information that's going on in Kentucky and then around the country. And uh, also get your all's feedback. And then we have, uh, you can do that in a variety of ways. We have GoSo box uh, that we've asked you that you take a look at the questions um, and respond to. Uh, this gives us some input with a statewide perspective of thing, but also helps you kind of give the perspective of how your, your peers are looking at uh, at information. So that's one way. Uh, we also have uh, what Go Subbox feature is pretty cool, as you can make a point there, and the, the the top ones bubble to the top, and we usually take a look at those and see what's bubbling to the top. Uh, also, we have the chat feature there, and obviously for our district staff that are watching live, you can unmute and and join as well. Uh, so um, we have those variety of ways to get your get your feedback. Um, so I'll uh, I'll start out with and I'll share my screen and I sent you um, all earlier kind of what I'm going to just to be speaking to. I'm going down this list and you can copy and paste from that. And there may be some changes based upon today's meeting that we that we have. Um, so I'm going to. First of all, I'll start out with uh, uh, this first one here from uh, CETA, uh, State Education Technology Director Association. We, we K, the agency, are part of that. Um, we're also part of an, another group called the uh, Chief State School Officers, CCSSO, uh, CIO Network, which has um, uh, my, my equivalent position in, in other states, um, although not every, every state has, a, has an equivalent position. Um, to what we're doing here in Kentucky and in North Carolina and Wisconsin. Um, but this is a group that uh, uh, recently took a survey that I want to share with you. All 50 states responded to this. And uh, so I think it's it's worthy in that that, that capacity of taking a, a look at it. And it just gives you some some feedback. I, um, I think we're feeling this top one. And we'll talk about in a little bit here how these are impacting some of the items we have. Um, like uh, STLP and even computer science um, in, in a way. Um, so getting, you know, educators, um, getting them and keeping them, a massive loss across this country and across this state. Um, also other related positions to K-12, um, bus drivers in particular is a, is a major issue across this country. Um, and you see the other items that are here. The teaching point of this to the group. Uh, so um, the organization that did this report presented to the group of state level uh, K-12 CIOs um, uh, last week. And uh, the key teaching point here that they're making is, and we always try to do this technology, try to follow what the top priorities are educationally to your organizations. And then try to, you know, try to say, you know, try to find a way if there is a way uh, how technology can help out with those. Um, there are some areas obviously we can't, but, but definitely in these areas here, uh, what are the areas that we can do to address and help um, the commissioner uh, level positions or the superintendent level positions and the boards across uh, the country and each every district address these needs. So I just encourage you to, you know, find a way um, to, to move yourself in those conversations about and be thoughtful of that. When they ask questions about um, does your state have the following, what are the top ones? And these are some of the go soapbox questions. These are from state level positions um, uh, across the country in K-12 departments of education. I'm interested in kind of how that plays out in questions three through seven in your organizations. Um, so, you know, how, how does that do? Uh, you know, these are ones that we relate to, um, uh, but interested in if that applies to you as well. Obviously, these are these are on our radar screen as well. The effective use of technology. This takes me to um, what we do. And if, it, if you take a look at the master plan of education technology, 
Uh, one of the key items that we have in there that we regularly recommend districts do is annually take a health check of what items are being used a lot and not used a lot. Um, and the ones that use a little bit, you know, you may have a vocal group to keeping them. Um, we had that across the state with um, uh, a piece of a, a service that we offered for professional development that used uh, technology or, or uses videos through our technology services um, to educate teachers on how to teach math and science and physics. But we actually found only three percent, um, three to five percent were using that. It was important to those three to five percent, but ninety-five percent were not. And so that was a service that uh, KDHC stopped offering. So it's the same kind of question. You have something that 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 allows you to get that information back. Uh, is it being used effectively or not? You know, we do that somewhat at the state level with our technology readiness survey, with our feedback that we get from every district in the year that kind of talks, talks about the things we're doing well, not well, what need to be our goals for the following year. Uh, but something for you to think of is all this money has been invested, and I think that was the teaching point, in technology through a variety of federal funds. As we briefed the last webcast, is we have more technology funding this school year and the next one than we've ever had in the 30 years of cats um, then it drops off significantly because that federal funding drops off so people are saying well tell me about the difference this is making or or not making so we would have put our, ourselves in the collection that we do do something to collect that this was interesting to me uh, always is and i'm so fortunate to be here in Kentucky as the last webcast that we had, I, I share with you the states that are similar to Kentucky and for the most part, they've always been similar uh, with a statewide approach, meaning they're, they're there to help all the school districts. I, I gotta tell you a very high percentage of states, every, every school is completely on their own. And what that means is you have huge gaps of service that really came to light during the pandemic. Uh, you had maybe 10%, 15% okay, and the other 80, 85% way not okay. Um, so, in a, in a, an indicator of that is this: you, does your level of position, like mine does, report directly to the commissioner? Yes, it does. Um, and our ed tech priority is important to the leadership. Yes, they are in, K, in KDE, and they have been for a while. So, be interested in your feedback in that area. And the last one we're asking for feedback is, um, I know, just around cybersecurity. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes here about where, where Kentucky is on that. Um, you know, it's always tough for someone to say they have ample uh, on cybersecurity. There's always probably a desire to want more uh, than that. Um, but these are kind of the feedback that from the, the state levels of, you know, where they're at. I, I, I feel like we've gotten pretty, uh, pretty solid uh, security uh, or funding for cybersecurity and definitely got to focus on it. A big part of our uh, federal funds uh, we're using for cybersecurity and uh, finding an ongoing funding source for that as well. And definitely this is a service around cybersecurity that uh, our DOE provides services to all school districts and a very high percentage of, of other states. And it, it, it played out during the pandemic with all these major attacks that we have on K-12 and ongoing. Uh, that everyone is very vulnerable uh, for the most part in other states. I'm not saying that we're perfect, but uh, uh, do, do it fairly well here in Kentucky. So, I want so to give David, you... before, before you go forward, let me uh, yes. say something real quick. As I look back on the process that CD used to collect this uh, information, which I think started in May, um, I'm pretty confident they reached out to multiple points of contact within a state uh, to get feedback. And so I'm interested and in maybe people can stick it in the Go Soapbox chat or just maybe let your KE know or whatnot. If you received something from CETA and might have responded to it uh, or, you know, on, on this one or any other one, actually, uh, because I'm I'm interested in how that's occurring and I'm going to be following up on that as well, just to, to make sure that uh, I'm understanding how CEDA is reaching out directly to district level folks and different folks within the state on these surveys. So, uh, so anyways, if anybody's got, if they've had any, received anything or responded, I'm, I'm not interested necessarily on how you responded. Obviously, you'll be able to respond to our questions that will help us understand how folks in our state feel about these. But, um, but I am interested if anybody received anything or, or whatnot, or you can just shoot me an email and let me know. Either way, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mike. 
Uh, next one deals with cybersecurity. We, we've talked about this a lot, and I hope you had the opportunity to, um, um, and no later than the August timeframe, is, is give an update to your superintendent and board. I did that uh, for our commissioner and for our board. Um, I've taken a small excerpt of that and, and shared it uh, with you. Um, and, and mainly part of it is, is to talk and educate our folks that you know this is a constant large scale attack um, that is targeting uh, education. And uh, uh, Commissioner Glass told me yesterday he was at a separate meeting uh, because when I presented this to the Board of Education, the Kentucky Board of Education, I pointed out how K-12 is the number one target of cyber criminals. Um, uh, or education is, I should say, in general, educational organizations, this chart right here. And one of the board members really thought that would be, uh, you know, the financial kind of industries. And uh, so our commissioner was at a separate type of meeting um, uh, last week uh, that had, you know, folks that really are knowledgeable about this. And he also got confirmation because someone in the group also said, well, I thought finance would be number one. And education is by far the number one target of cyber criminals um, and cyber attackers. And so, um, you know, we've uh, uh, been fairly successful I'm not trying to, to, to motivate any cyber attackers uh, right now. Uh, you kind of can see Kentucky compared to the other states around the United States in a chart I'll scroll down to. And that's not by luck. Uh, that is by um, I would say, you know, a lot of things have to do with our product and design standards that uh, nearly no other, other state does not have. Um, cyber d defense uh, d design and then just trying to get, you know, folks more cybersecurity savvy. This morning I sent out a note before this one about uh, multi-factor authentication for all KD staff. We know about a third of the districts have already done it. We've been piloting it. Uh, and OET for all OET staff and a few offices in KD, but we're got now going, you know, uh, to continue on with that to come more cybersecurity savvy and prepared um, as we go down this uh, go down this journey. And talked about some of the standards that we have in place that have allowed to do that, and that's the importance of having statewide uh, product standards because it really does make your cybersecurity defense um, much stronger than if everybody's off uh, doing their own thing. You're trying to provide a, 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 a you know somewhat of a security barrier for them. And this is you know Kentucky in comparison, and you know we can say well Kentucky's a small state, but you know there are some states not uh, uh, too much bigger than Kentucky that are way up here. You know Nebraska is not a um, you know state that uh, is uh, it's about the same size as Kentucky somewhat, as I can recall. Maybe it's a little bit bigger or smaller, but um, you can see that we we want to keep on being on that small slice right there. And uh, Bob, anything else you'd like to mention about this very quickly? David, one thing I will say is obviously um, attackers go for where the money is, and um, you know you can. Uh, it, it's great that we've got more money than we've we've ever had, but again, they're also going to be targeting some of those other states. Obviously, California. Uh, New York, some of those states that do get more money, uh, they're going to get targeted um, first. But it's so easy to target everybody at the same time now that somewhat levels the playing field. And and so that's something to kind of keep in mind as well. And and so, I, like you said, I really want us to keep exactly where we are in that chart, if not even move further back yeah. if we possibly can. And that's something all of us have a role in doing and um and i appreciate everyone's effort in that i really do back meaning smaller right um here's the exactly. other part and, and, and this there's somewhat of a reason i'm introducing this these topics about uh, um i think folks really underestimate uh, still even though we're talking about it that how much on the radar screen education organizations are and how the size and scale of these attacks and what we're doing going forward, we have to be very mindful of the size uh, and scale and sophistication of those attacks, or we're being, we're being negligent in what we're doing. And so you can see, you know, we estimate around 4 billion with a B, as Bob would say, and up to 16 billion, it, you know, has, has increased. And they're getting more sophisticated, more intense in what they're doing. And therefore, we, we obviously can't compromise and go backward in, in our, you know, cybersecurity defense. We have to get, you know, improve upon it.
Uh, Mike, the next topics we had here is to give an update on the um, EdTech contracts and really just one we're giving an update on. Yep. Um, am I showing up? I'm not showing that I'm showing up, but I should be. I see you. Okay, yeah. I don't see myself. So anyway, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, the the one obviously we want to for sure mention is the next generation K through 12 internet. And, and really, I can't say a whole lot more than I've said uh, in the last month, which is that that's in process progressing forward as we would expect and hope for it to. So, uh, you know, again, no, no red flags, no concerns. So uh, that's something we certainly have to have in place as we move forward with our internet services throughout the next several years and for the upcoming E-rate filing, as everybody's aware. Um, the, uh, I, will, I will just mention, since we're talking on the topics of, you know, we continue to work on preliminary activity around a, uh, the idea of moving forward with uh, a, new, a new solution in place for SEEK which is a big deal. We'd mentioned that previously. And again, those are, that's kind of in the prelim, what I'd call the preliminary activity associated to that. And the other thing I'll mention, which I know has been on the KE agenda for local meetings, is that we're looking at our options around identity management and that uh, group of activity that goes with that. And certainly uh, our contractual options, including uh, the potential of an RFP option is part of that uh, activity as well. And again, I know the KEs are having those conversations uh, in their in their local groups <clears throat> and mike I, I wanted to just bring up and mention there when we talk about that um that topic and and you know we're really excited about it the idea of um automated provisioning um establishing a single source for authentication big big time emphasis on age and ability appropriate uh logging in authentication um, that we're really excited about that, and we've definitely heard you as EdTech leaders, um, and that message that will be carried forth through all of our field staff in, in preliminary discussions. Uh, the message, you know, today is, as Mike said, we're looking at, um, you know, potential, you know, procurement may be um, one of those avenues, but it's it's hold right now on if you are if you are investigating or thinking about a new way uh, for your users to um, to be connected and that experience that they're having um, hold right now because we're working really hard on our next steps um, as a statewide uh, shared service and we're really excited about it. Yep. Good deal. David, I can go ahead and jump to the next item we had, I think, in your in the way you had the agenda laid out um, around KETS offers. And uh, really, the, the update on that is we're still on track for the 1st of October to begin uh, sending those notifications out to districts for offers. And we have landed on the fact that we'll be able to go ahead and go with the first offer being at $12. I know last update I had said it would be between 9 and 12, that first offer. So we're comfortable in go uh, going ahead and having that uh, first offer be $12 again with a projection of the overall year being 21 um, and obviously if we can adjust that up we will hopefully we don't have to ha adjust it down we don't feel like we would uh, but again first offer first week of October and that will be $12 and so folks can look forward to that notification coming their way. <clears throat> Thanks and uh, just to educate folks you know we go through this step of uh, getting our board approval which you did in August and then uh, uh, very recently, the School Facility Constructs Commission, that that relationship has served us extremely well, and I always take the opportunity to educate the School Facility Constructs Commission Board on the important role that the School Facility Constructs Commission plays on uh, helping us get the offers out, but also protecting our money from legislators, what I would call get the big eye, um, and they see that money in, in the bank account that is de you know designed to go to school districts because they have up to three years to match it thinking that you just grab it. And so they have been an excellent organization over the past 30 years uh, for protecting that funding source for folks getting the big eye, uh, but also a great teammate uh, as well. So thanks to School Facility. I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, did, I do want to give them high fives going forward. Marty and Jeff, we have some uh, announcements to talk about with STLP regionals and state coming up. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, we are ramped up and excited, and I know Jeff, you, uh, I saw your, saw you online here, ready to jump in as well. We are ramped up and excited for uh, the 22-23 school year for um, our Student Technology Leadership Program. As you know, of all the programs and all the technologies that we implement, um, we have some that are adult-facing or teacher-facing, um, and then we have some of our 
programmatic work that is student facing. Um, and STLP is certainly one of those programs that uh, is a long serving program, uh, but we really get to see students making and creating and using technologies in the learning phase, uh, which is which is super awesome for us. So um, again, uh, as I just said on uh, the connected user experience, um, we, we've heard you <laughs> and um, the demand by you and de demand by districts. Um, you were very clear um, last year in our cycle where um, we've had great student participation. It continues to increase. Um, and so we want to we want to continue to celebrate that and promote that and e get even more students involved. And so um, our theme for this year uh, is all in. We are we are absolutely all in um, for the student experience. Uh, we want you to gear up and get ready for April 19th, which is the state championship. And we're excited to see everyone and all of your students um, at the state championship uh, April 19th. And so we're all in this year. Um, and then demand by by uh by districts and and by you as leaders uh you've given great feedback and david already mentioned some of the challenges that we're all faced with and um one of one of those challenges is you know uh substitute teachers and bus drivers and and so um this year's cycle for our regional work uh will be um all connected uh, all online uh, and ready to go to to work with and and uh, serve as many students as possible. We're excited about that, um, and uh, we feel like the process that we proved out last year was was phenomenal. Um, it was great to get as many students involved as possible in order to help students progress uh, to have a project ready for the state championship. Uh, which again is April 19th. We'll say that a few more times so that you can mark your calendars. Uh, Jeff, is there anything else you, you want to add? I know you are working statewide and working with our higher ed partners and working with uh, at regional level and our cooperatives and, and specifically district by district to implement the 22-23 all-in plan for uh, STLP this year. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Uh, I'll be super quick. We do have some great partnerships going with our, our higher ed institutions that we're continuing. We're excited to see how they're going to continue to support you regionally and bring some exciting new activities and opportunities for students to participate at the state championship April 19th. Um, so I, I just want to real quick touch on a couple of great things that we have going on with this. The fact that we are uh, following the model that we have in place now for regionals for this fall means that we have had opportunities to work with the educators in your district to make it as strong, basically the best regional that we've ever had, which is our goal all the time. So we're going to take advantage of these resources, take advantage of 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 all of the benefits that the students have from doing their project presentations from their home setting. Um, the benefit of that is we also, as Marty pointed out, we've upped the game a little bit on the rigor of the judging and made it even um, more helpful to students as they are preparing to go all in and hopefully come to the state championship. So I just the last thing I wanna do is touch on that, the all in concept. Um, one of the beauties, you know, being a former CIO, one of the beauties of knowing and, uh, you know, as Mike mentioned a little bit ago about, you know, maybe it's time to you know, hold off on some of your planning and prioritizing for us. Now that we know that regionals are not going to require a bus, they're not going to require a bunch of travel, and a bunch of expense to do that. Let's transfer all of that to the all in concept. Start now securing transportation, setting the expectation that the STLP state championship is this amazing all day experience um, that's worth the effort it takes to get there and to get home late. We heard from your feedback last year, areas that we needed to improve, things that we could take advantage of in this new facility uh, that we're utilizing for state. And so we're very excited to be able to ramp up and build off of that feedback to help make sure that we are getting again the best stlp state experience for you and your students the last thing is i'll drop into the chat is our for folks that are interested this this has gone out on the list serve and and has been circulating around to all the different groups but for your information if you're interested in any of the updates we have our headlines and deadlines 
for September. I've dropped those in the chat. You feel free to check those out, share with any STLP coaches. Um, we're off to a great start, and I appreciate everybody's support and feedback. So through the through the all-in model um, for this year, um, building off of last year and last year's feedback, number one, um, Jeff, uh, you shared with David and I and, and, our, and the rest of our leadership team that um, the, the student projects and student products uh, had a had a huge increase in, in rigor and quality last year, which we were couldn't be more excited about. Um, and number two, the feedback that the adults, judges, teachers um, that went to students um, was of much higher quality um, than than in the past because of the timing and the mechanism. And so those are the things that we want to build on and, and, and are super excited about, because at the end of the day, it's about um, students and it's about student products and uh, what students are able to make and do um, with the technologies. David, thank you for that time. Yeah, I, I think and just to be, you know, just just transparent for folks is I, I love the in-person regionals. I think most people did. I mean, it's one of the things that I, I call my 10 favorite days of the year. Um, and those were, you know, going um, uh, to the regionals and the state championship, of course, the KISTI conference as well. And there's a few others I'm probably mentioning that the favorite days of the year. But, um, you know, even, you know, during the pandemic, we couldn't have them. And um, as we looked at this time, we were originally talked about five, maybe in person and other virtual, because virtual is always going to be part of the toolbox. But the reality is going back to the very first chart I showed is, you know, and in, in, in looking at this and getting feedback, uh, we will have regional sites, but very few people will be able to attend due to the substitute teacher issue and the busing issue. I'm hoping, you know, the next year um, that we can get back to in-person regionals, but there always, always will be this, this virtual option as well. And, and virtual options always going to be part of these these toolboxes, you know, going, going forward. Um, but, you know, I, I'd be the first one to say, I wish we were getting back to that somewhat here and we're trying to make the best of it, uh, be honest with you. So what, what you're hearing is, okay, uh, given uh, the situation, and we saw last year at the, the state that we had, uh, and, and we were dealing with teacher issues and bus driver issues then, that they were able to make it happen. And so in picking one and realizing, okay, let's go all in on this. And so that's what's happening. And so appreciate your understanding, but, but hopefully, in future years, we're, we're, we're getting teachers to fill positions and bus drivers, and this is a one-year type of thing, but uh, maybe it's not, and we'll have to continue David, as well for a period of time. David, one, one final share there. One of our uh, EdTech leaders um, who have been a longtime uh, supporter partner um, with STLP shared with us um, not too long ago that um, and, and we absolutely agree that the best thing for students is any in-person experience. Um, and she shared that in-person experience is absolutely her favorite. And, and how, however, in this at this time, she probably wouldn't be able to send students. And so that's that's one of those uh, uh, bits of feedback that we're, we're moving on and acting on. Yep. Um, OK, thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, so let's talk about. Uh, um, internet bandwidth. Uh, I mean, I think we've been pretty good stewards of taxpayer funds over the past few years with technology in general uh, and tried to make the most of the bandwidth that we've had. Um, and, you know, this came to light in a couple of different ways for me, and I always try to use some other analogies that are out there. If anyone's gone camping, uh, and I had pop-up camper with our four kids, um, and if you have a generator, uh, you got to be very strategic on what you turn on and don't turn on uh, with these smaller generators. Um, for example, if you turn a hair dryer on, um, there's not much else you can do in a small camper when the hair dryer's going. Um, same thing would be when we had um, an ice storm where I live in Woodford County uh, a few years ago. I used that same generator to provide power to the house. And bigger than a pop-up camper for sure, but you can't have like the microwave running. You can't have a dryer running uh, at the same time as many other things and a hair dryer. So probably could have one hair dryer going and really, you know, the lights are off and you, you get really strategic on which lights are on in a house uh, when you're running off or even in a camper when you're when you're uh, uh, running on a, a smaller generator. And even if you get a bigger one, you still got to be strategic on the kind of things you, you turn on and off. Uh, and even during non-generator times, most of you have circuit breakers that, uh, like in our house, if the, if the hair dryer is going on and the hair dryer is on the sump pump, 
uh, and we're dealing with some you can't have both those on, it'll click it off, it'll override the circuit breaker. So most of our folks are, are familiar with that. But I find that a very high percentage of people are pretty unaware of how much bandwidth they are taking up. So I'm going to give this example. I was at my uh, our farm in Breathitt County, um, and um, we had I had set it up. It was the NCAA semifinals, and I had tested it out. And we were getting you know the wire. We had a hot spot, and we were getting wireless from the from the tower that was pretty close. The upper Lancaster uh, Tower that was really close, and so we we're all gathered around it. And then when game time came up, you, you know I couldn't get anything. I'm like, what's going on here? So I look around. At, you know, some teenagers that were in there, I'm going, what are you all doing? What, what kind of things are you doing right now? And you could tell, and for the most part, folks are oblivious to how much bandwidth they're consuming. So one was watching, trying to watch high definition movie. One was, was playing a game. One other one was on Facebook doing some things. This was not, you know, a, a, a hotspot that was large. It was a smaller one. So I had to say, you know, everybody turn off your, your, your turn off that stuff. And immediately when they did that, the game came on, but you could tell much like, you know, with the, with the generator that we had in the camper that, that folks were, were totally unaware of, of how much bandwidth they were taking up. And so this, this came, you know, to, to, to light during the, during the pandemic. And we put out a document um, that uh, uh, we, we sent out here. This is part of the bandwidth discussion that we're having here um, that was for homes during the pandemic and really trying to educate them on what things take up a lot of bandwidth. And, you know, the link was sent to you um, um, in, in, the, in, this, in this presentation here, um, but really educating them on there's some things that take up gobs of bandwidth. And so if you're doing, you know, uh, you know online instruction like we were on that time, remote and virtual instruction for a very high percentage of students, you're gonna need to walk around the house to make sure no one's you know watching high definition movies or even low definition movies bunch of not doing youtube or gaming uh, in order for instruction to occur during those hours and uh, you know i go back to the early 90s we were giving people you know analogies and i talk about hair dryers and microwaves well i used to talk about it like on a road that you know a, a video is kind of like being a double wide trailer on a road and the email and texting is like a volkswagen beetle or a motorcycle as far as how much space they take up. And I think people are pretty unaware of how much stuff, um, how much space they're taking up um, on the internet with what they're, uh, what they're doing. And so that, that was our way to, to educate them on it, uh, which will relate to some of the topics I'm talking about below. Our staff is aware of us going through these type of items here when we're asking questions about technology enabled initiatives. And so, uh, and we have a lot that come here at the agency, a lot of folks are, they're proposing it is, and then I'm sure you all have them too. But always the first question is, can you do it? And you say, can you and should you? And I would always say just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's something I go over and over and over again with our technology staff here is just because something can be done doesn't mean it should be done. So for example, you can technically build a bridge out of refrigerators, use refrigerators. Should you do that? No, but can you do that? Yes. And typically in this discussion, how much? It is, is, is put off and then definitely went to get to the who pays, what's the, what's the specific funding source? And then what is the legal purchasing mechanism always comes up. So for our staff, we're constantly, and they've heard me say this, you know, over and over again before we get to do some things, but there's another level here for those, for those items that come into play with items that I'll be talking about below. Um, you know, the first item always has been since the early 90s, since we launched um, uh, the Kentucky K-12 internet service, is really its primary focus is on student academics, the instruction, the core operations of a district, the communications, uh, the finances of a district during prime time instructional hours. And obviously, um, I'm familiar with that. I'm not, uh, I'm just talking about it from a classroom perspective, is my mom, longtime teacher, and I saw the hours that she put in uh, during and afterward. You know, I have, uh, uh, Two of my children that are that are K-12 teachers and then two of my son-in-laws are. So I definitely hear that that firsthand and know their hours are just not 6 a.m. to 3 or 3.30, but they go a little bit longer. You know, we'll, we'll extend it to 4 p.m. And originally when I put out a note that, that you saw, we, we, we extend to 6 p.m., but uh, but after the pandemic, we brought it down to 4 p.m. So that's a that's a core component of what we do. And it's just not you can't use something that says, well, 
that is 99.99% not instructional, but you've got this little tiny thing going with it that counted as instructional. No, you know, and, and definitely from an E-rate perspective, you can't. So let's talk about the impact of money and funding. What's the primary funding source to pay for something? What is it what's really intended to pay for? How does the money work? And so I spent a lot of time with our staff and with you all trying to help educate you on the, uh, how the money works, because how the money works explains a lot of a, of a person's motivations, um, typically. Uh, and so you got to understand how the money works for type of things. And, and for us, does it jeopardize E-rate funding? And we always try to stay on the high ground. We don't game play. I'm not a game player trying to, I'm not talking about uh, electronic games or any other types of games. Just talking about a game player trying to trying to find a way around a system. Um, typically go along with it and try to make it work the best we can. So Mike, I'd like for us to talk about um, just briefly here about the E-rate piece, because another big focus that we really want to focus in on core instructional things being done during those hours, because E-rate comes into play. If you're doing and using the K-12 network for, for non-instructional core operations types of things, then what we can get into and impacts you financially. So I want you to understand the money. You know that second catch off assistance. Mike talked about the first one. And that comes from our from our cats funding source uh, that we're trying to get increased, by the way. Um, the second one is exclusively from E-rate rebates. And so we don't want to do anything that jeopardizes that. So anything that would cause us to be able to apply for less um, money, getting that back, which we send to you all, would impact that second offer assistance. It, all, it also impacts you all. So if you're using 30% of your instructional network, or non-instructional types of things, um, uh, non-core operations types of things. Um, and we're going to talk about those with some of the things that we've listed below. Is what that means is later on the E-rate folks could say, you know what, you need to subtract that from what you're applying for, which impacts you financially, would impact the second offer of assistance that we give. So that's something we always take a look at, especially in, in things that are growing in size. So they're maybe budget, they're they're bandwidth dust right now. But they appear to be growing in size and definitely, you know, video, as I mentioned before, of any form takes up a lot, a lot of bandwidth. Anything that's growing in numbers of, of end pieces that would be doing something is something we got to be very sensitive to that and really making sure that's occurring beyond instructional hours. So, Mike, is there anything else that you would add on? Well, to that? it's really going to be reiterating what you said. You know, uh, the E-rate program is uh, somewhat non-specific on how to measure what's an acceptable amount of use of the internet outside of instructional classroom activity um, and so it really has to be something that you know you're comfortable defending and that it, and that it, you can defend that it's not a disruption to the use of the internet connectivity for instructional classroom activity and um, the uh, and, and, and so I always look at that as if it's a if it's for all intents purposes, a non-measurable amount of use of the internet, and again, outside of instructional classroom activity time, uh, core time, you know, core classroom time. Um, and we've always been comfortable in, in, in capturing it that way, defending it that way. Um, but as more use occurs, obviously that becomes more difficult to do. And that's really what you were speaking to. And we have to be, we have to be, we have to get a little more specific on how we're, how we're looking at that, how we're measuring that. Cause you know, you could, you can always get quest to ask the question, well, how do you know that? I mean, you know, how do you know you don't have disruption to your internet uh, availability to uh, the core purpose of, 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 of for the E-rate funding, uh, at least, um, and, and, and its use toward the uh, internet connection? So, so what, that's something we got to continue to look at um, and continue to, to uh, either be comfortable that we're uh, still within a, a reasonable amount that is defendable and justifiable as far as how we're uh, defending that as far as E-rate dollars going toward the, the our full our full uh, uh, subscription, if you will, of, of Internet access to the school districts. Um, and if we reach a point where we don't feel like we can do that, then as David said, we've got to start deducting from what we're requesting E-rate dollars for. And we have to, you know, that if, if nothing else, that's a painful process to have to get into, quite honestly. So, so that, that's that, but, but if we, you know, if we had to do that, we had to do it. The same thing at the school level, at the district or at the district level, I should say, the districts have to keep in mind the same thing when you talk about your E-rate 
um, funding that you're getting for any kind of connections between your schools and your district. So you have to keep the same thing, uh, same things in mind there. The other, the last thing I want to mention, which I think is the most er the area that's most clear from the E-rate program, is that if you're doing anything with the internet that it, uh, that starts to involve an exchange of dollars, uh, profit, or anything like that, then it is much more clear on the fact fact that you've got to cost allocate that out. Uh, for whatever that usage is that is occurring, that is generating any, any kind of exchange of dollars um, or profit for any organization. So, so again, all of that said, we got to continue to keep an eye on it, as David said, and, and it's something that we certainly are trying to monitor. Uh, and, and, and we've asked specific questions uh, and, and, and unfortunately not gotten as, as specific answers as we would have liked, as well as other states have asked those questions as well. With this idea of more use occurring outside of classroom time and, you know, people wanting to utilize those connections, which again, we, we, we agree, you need to be able to use those connections. We just have to make sure that we're doing it within the parameters that we're allowed. Uh, and if we have to go beyond that, we've got to put processes in place by which we manage it. Mike, I'm glad you hit upon that, uh, that last point there, because part of the, the, the information that I shared with you yesterday shows that, a good good number of these that we're talking about really need that that need to occur after 4 p.m. are money making. Uh, they involve money. Somebody's making money. Uh, and then there's nothing wrong with people making money. Uh, but as you as you said, Mike, is from an E-rate perspective, of services that are using during prime time and structural hours, it is problematic, uh, and it is a potential loss of, of funds and significant funds uh, to to Kentucky K-12 Ed Tech and the district budget and the state budget that we send. But also, just to be honest with you, is uh, but besides all that, um, is really the focus during the school day needs to be school um, and school operations. And I'm, I'm for all the other extracurricular types of things, other things that go beyond that. Uh, obviously, I've, I've uh, benefited that as, a, as an individual over the years when I was a student and as a dad. Uh, so I understand the benefits of that, but it's something we got to keep in mind. Obviously, we've talked about cybersecurity and safety before we do anything. Um, uh, we always got to keep those in mind, understanding the level of attack and sophistication of attacks that we're on, and that applies to the, the, the information that we uh, are talking about today. Um, um, also, the, just the, how much bandwidth does it take up? That's why we spent time on the video piece. Anything that's grabbing video or, or requiring a large chunk of our bandwidth, we're going to be very interested in, <clears throat> especially during school hours, but also we we'll want to keep an eye on what it takes afterward. And that's something you all will have to prioritize. The after school hours is really a call that you make about um, things that you're doing. If you have an academic contest and you have something that's not related to academics after school hours, you have to determine, does that get my bandwidth or does something else I'm doing get the bandwidth? Uh, we, would, we would give the incentive to the academic contest um, uh, over some things not even related to school related activities or whatever is, where it's happening there. So. Um, um, let's talk about the impact of uh, also the impact on the product, uh, uh, the catch product uh, and service and design standards that we have in place that I've, I've talked about served as well. The, the Gartner hype cycle is fascinating. If you're not familiar with that, I gave the link of just where is a product and service at in its evolution. Typically, you want to pick it not when it's at the plateau of, of, of uh, or, or in, in the trough of disillusionment. Um, or the peak of uh, over of expectations, but the plateau of productivity is where you want to grab that. So that's an interesting chart, no matter if you're technology or not. And we always take a look at is people coming and going, you know, and, and particularly with districts, they may want to do something, but this is based on a personality. If they lose that personality in that district's in a lot of problem of maintaining that. And that's occurred over the years as people coming and going as we've uh, gotten with, uh, uh, with with superintendents over the years. So those are our some of our main driving uh, factors. And then just, just a reminder that uh, uh, we put out this note um, last, by the way, is, uh, and I can't see, is, is Tim Biscoff on here yet? Tim Yon? He has not joined yet. Oh, ah, okay. Hmm. All right, uh, then I'll, uh, let me go around him. So I can make sure some of that stuff later. Um, or he may be sending me a note that says he's having some kind of problem getting in, I'll have to do it. So this is a reminder of, of folks of what we sent out related to this topic of uh, internet usage uh, during the core and non-core instructional hours. This was sent back in May of, of 2021. Um, and we modified it to, to 4 p.m. Um, 
I'd be honest with you, I'd like to have had that longer than school day, knowing that uh, how long school folks stay around and make sure that the priority stays with them versus other things that take a lot of bandwidth, but we'll see how that plays out with, uh, with 4 p.m. I thought Tim said he was enjoying his 1015, but maybe that was 11. Yeah. Hey, David, I'm here. Oh, OK, good, good. Uh, can you make sure we have Tim as presentation rights? Tim, you prepared to show off your computer or to show off yours or you want me to? to, to I can to show, show from here. OK, Tim, Tim is a presenter, David. OK, good. So Tim, this is talk before you start uh, showing some things here. I'm just going to highlight, um, you know, this good relationship we have with um, with KET and High School Lake Association, some of these other organizations. And uh, I didn't, I wanted to not have you on here the whole time. So just, just as an introduction, Tim Biscoff is the CIO and CTO for uh, Kentucky Educational Television. Um, and Tim, what stands out to me with, with both KET and High School Lake Association is how tiny your organizations are in relationship to the services that you offer. Um, uh, so, um, and Tim has been on here before to give some updates on, 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 uh, on some things going on that our two organizations work together on. That's you know, a history of 50 years of organizations working collaboratively on things together. And I'll be you know, sharing, uh, sharing those. Um, you know, the, uh, just to give you a little bit of history on um, um, you know, KET is, uh, you know, I you know, benefited from it greatly as a student. My mom was a power user of uh, KET and you know at home it was a requirement uh, for me to watch KET versus ball games by the way Tim so um, that was uh, that was the priority in our house was was KET during the year so you obviously see that in my interactions with you having grown up with it but just the changes that have occurred over the years with KET you know I I can remember when I first started in 1992 uh, there was no Kentucky K-12 internet service and so I actually came over to KET and we had the broadcast booth there and and uh, the, the cool thing was Kentucky was the very first state to have educational television at every school, uh, which is a pretty cool thing. I want to make sure Kentuckians know that, know that. And so that was a neat thing to have some way in a live manner to reach every school. So I would go over there and I can remember when we were doing the very first um, Kentucky Education Technology System catch bid for computers. We remember announcing it over there and we had Carol Birch, who was part of our staff, was one of our big followers uh, that was on there, there and there being. But it was a really added value of having KT, the connection there. But I've seen you all involved over the years. And the really cool thing about our organizations is we've not seen each other as competitors, but how can we work together with each other's technology? Um, and as the internet came in, it wasn't, you know, KT never did anything to undermine we we're doing the internet, but you can see how they've adapted that to their portfolio of services over the years. And I can remember we had, um, you had little caching devices in schools, uh, Tim, that cached the video, and then you had video capturing systems that cached it so people didn't have to watch that, you know, live, they could watch recordings of it. And it was a big expensive expense in school districts to get those video caching or, or, or you know, recording devices for all that so they can then broadcast out to any kind of you know teacher that wanted it and now to see what is transitioned to is you know the anytime anywhere always on learning with KT with the internet you also do live broadcasts as well uh, but I thought it'd be worthy I'm going to give some other stats of things related that we cover uh, we cover about what we're doing with PBS learning media in just a little bit that um, Shay Hopkins who's the executive director for KT and the really cool thing about Shay is she's been there toward the very beginning of it and it was one of the first ones that was holding up those cards that people would read that are presenting. She was there there to, that has now over all these years uh, led and is an outstanding leader and recognized uh, for, for KT across the country. But it's also unique, Tim, in the relationship that KET has with KDE compared to the other 49 states. Um, and I would say that with High School Collect Association as well, is we really do have a very close connection where most other states, probably 90, 95% do not have that. And so this is something we cherish. And so this partnership that we have and this teamwork we have is a pretty cool thing. So I wanted you to share and, and kind of if you can relate it to how it would impact students in the school building as we're talking about the next generation of TV uh, as well as beyond the school building. So Tim. Great. Thank you. Here, let me uh, share my screen and the PowerPoint. Let's see, can you see that now? 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to share what KET is doing and our progress toward next gen TV. That's uh, going to be the bulk of what I talk about today and also how uh, KET's longstanding partnership with the Kentucky Department of Education uh, extends all the way to technology and more. You're going to talk about content as well. Um, so first, a little bit, uh, a brief uh, TV history lesson. Um, some on today's call, you may remember TV's transition from black and white uh, to color and the addition of stereo sound and the more recent transition um, to high definition digital TV. And for each of those upgrades, it actually took many years in the United States to implement new TV standards. What has to happen is over the air spectrum has to be reallocated. Broadcasters technologies have to be upgraded. That's transmitters and microwave interconnections and encoding, master control, lots of supporting infrastructure, studios, cameras. And at the end of, of, of all of that, viewers have to buy new TVs that are capable of all of these new technologies. Or if you'll recall, uh, maybe you got a converter box the last time we transitioned uh, to a new standard. That last uh, big change in TV standards, of course, was that shift from analog to digital TV. Now, that's DTV, and that was also known by its technical name, which is ATSC 3.0. It was actually authorized by the FCC in 1996, and that full transition uh, from analog to digital, it was completed 15 years later. So again, these things take a significant amount of time to transition an entire country, especially one as, as technically complex as the United States, to a new standard. It was completed in 2009. Now, the new standards for over-the-air broadcast television, they were authorized by the FCC in 2017. Technically, it's called ATSC 3.0. That's the Advanced Television Systems Committee. They're the standards group that make uh, that approve these standards, um, but it's known by its brand name, Next Gen TV. Now, uh, Next Gen TV is deploying across the United States. And actually, I skipped a slide here. Let me go back. OK, so uh, KET has been working uh, to implement next gen TV since it was established and authorized. Now, this is a glass to glass conversion. It's from the glass of our cameras all the way to the glass of your TV set and everything in between. And as you see in this slide, there's a lot in between. So when uh, the broadcast spectrum repack uh, occurred several years ago, we were able to upgrade our transmitters and our transmission line and our antennas to ATSC 3.0 next gen TV ready uh, equipment. We also had to reinforce our towers. We have towers that are from 100 to 1000 feet tall. You add weight to those towers. Of course, you have to add more steel to carry the weight. Uh, we also upgraded our microwave system, our remote control system and monitoring and security uh, for all of these transmission sites. So that part is complete with our transmitters and antennas. And right now we're working on uh, an encoding project uh, that also will upgrade to 3.0 ready encoders and provide local emergency alerting. Uh, at each of KET's transmission sites, which is a great new service that we'll be able to provide to help keep Kentuckians safe as severe weather uh, moves across the state. We're also working in our network center on what we're calling our next gen conversion. And that is a project I'll tell you more about in a minute, but that is upgrading our broadcast infrastructure, our master control and our editing systems that directly support KET's education mission and content. Every piece of educational content that KET creates uh, goes through all of this technical infrastructure. Um, and, and as you can imagine, particularly the editing system, every piece of video, it gets edited, it gets worked on um, to be prepared to be uh, appropriate for classrooms. And then looking into the future, our studio production systems in Louisville and Frankfurt and Lexington, field equipment that we use to go out and shoot in the field, that'll be a part of the future uh, conversion. Now, as I said before, Next Gen TV, it is rolling out across the country. It's deploying in the United States and internationally. More than 50 markets have launched Next Gen TV. There have been deployments in South Korea, Jamaica, India, and Brazil, Canada, and Mexico are also planning launches 
of this TV standard. What Next Gen TV allows us to do, this is over the air broadcast television. We're gonna have higher quality video and audio, more programming streams will be available, better reception, and this is really key um, as we look at how we distribute content, the reception will be better, and not just on a fixed antenna, but on a, on a mobile device. So you saw the image there of someone in a car moving down the street. Um, currently, if you're driving down the street, you can't receive a TV signal, but with NextGen TV, you'll be able to receive that signal. There'll be enhanced services, accessibility services, especially audio track services for the disabled, as well as interactive and personalized content, whether that's for public safety or for educational platforms. And this really gets to the point where we can deliver internet based content over the air through our through our stream because this uh, service is IP based. So as markets around the country are transitioning uh, to 3.0, the FCC actually mandates that, that new 3.0 stations have to simulcast their traditional DTV stream uh, as well to ensure that viewers can continue to receive and access the programming until next-gen TV um, is fully available and more common in households. And this is challenging because TV transmitters, they can't transmit a 1.0 and a 3.0 signal at the same time. The KET has two transmitters in Louisville, and that allows us to be able to launch 3.0 in Louisville and to simulcast uh, both on the DTV and the next gen side. And as we transition in other markets, we'll be working with uh, other broadcasters to transition. So here's, here's the big news. Um, yesterday, in fact, on September the 19th of this year, uh, just yesterday, we launched our first Next Gen TV station in Louisville on KET's uh, WKMJ service. And as I told you before, we've been working toward this milestone for several years. We upgraded our transmitters and our antennas. Uh, we upgraded that microwave interconnect. We upgraded encoding this year. And so we were really proud to turn that on. And we are now transmitting in Louisville. If you have a next gen TV, um, thank you. And if you have a next gen TV, uh, we will, uh, you can plug that in, you can scan, and you'll be able to pick up our next gen TV signals um, in Louisville if you're an over the air viewer. And over the air viewership is actually uh, pretty significant. So this is a chart that shows you what over the air viewership is in Louisville. Nearly 20% of households are over the air only. That's how they receive their television. And you can see that the first column here, ADS, that's actually satellite services like DISH and Direct. There's broadcast only, and this is a cable service. And then this category is broadband only. So people who are just using the internet. You can see there's been a lot of change between 2015 and now as broadcast only is actually increasing, broadband is increasing, cables decreasing, and uh, DISH and Direct are decreasing. You know, Tim, when my uh, children, uh, you know, I guess, you know, didn't realize I had air cable set up as well as backup, you know, to the regular cable system. And so uh, when uh, uh, my son moved to his, his apartment, uh, he says, I got nothing here, Dad. I said, well, you got air cable. And he had no idea what that was. And so folks under a certain age, obviously having grown up at a certain age, you're familiar with that that was the primary way that you got it. If right. you weren't sitting on top of the roof, to be like I was to try to aim stuff on top of the roof so you can get a signal at all. So um, it is interesting the transition that's occurring that's been around for quite some time. And with next gen TV, that reception is going to be better. And, and we know that some people, when they when we went through this transition last time, folks who could get us over the air, maybe it was a little bit fuzzy, but they could still get the signal. With digital TV, it was on or off. And so yeah. folks had reception issues. Um, Next Gen TV has a, a modulation frequency that aims to help correct that and um, that you can. You can just plug in that TV and you can scan it and get these channels um, over the air. If the kids don't like calling it over the air, we can call it wireless TV and it's a new <laughs> thing, right? Hey, wireless right. TV. Um, and I know the challenge that you have um, is just having some of these other folks uh, adapt it. So that's what you're working with these other stations about uh, including it and, and using it. Mm -hmm. So this is what you get if you tune in right now in Louisville on uh, channel 68. You'll see KET and KET2, the Kentucky channel, our kids channel. Um, the first two channels, we're proud we're able to put those out in full HD. We've not been able to do that before, so the quality will, will look great. And then also we're adding the world channel 
Uh, we simulcast, as I said, all of those on WKPC and ATSC 1.0 DTV. And if you go to KET.org, we also just launched all five of these streams at, at our live page, KET.org slash live. So you can watch these any, anywhere in the state. Um, we geolocate you because we can't, you know, someone can't go on the website from another country or, or state and tune in. But if you're in Kentucky or the, or the surrounding counties and other states, you'll be able to watch. Um, so uh, what do viewers need to do if you're a traditional uh, 1.0 DTV viewer in Louisville, you will need to rescan your TV to make sure that you're getting our traditional services. If you're on cable or satellite, you don't need to do anything. Uh, the cable and satellite companies have made those changes for you and are making sure you're getting the same channels you were getting before. If you are a 3.0 viewer, you have a next gen TV set or a uh, adapter, uh, or if you don't have a next gen TV set, uh, you can get one. They're available from Hisense, LG, Samsung, and Sony. Um, you can go to a web page. It's called watchnextgentv.com. Watchnextgentv.com. I'll put that in the chat here in a minute. And um, that gives you a full listing with links where you can go and purchase a TV set. I think the Hisense sets are, are even around $600. So for a TV, they're not. Thank you. The TVs are uh, not. Uh, incredibly expensive. Of course, you can spend as much as you want to on a TV, as I'm sure you've all seen if you go into the store or go online, but there are some affordable ones as well. And I also um, want to, to talk about the next-gen conversion that's happening here um, in the network center uh, at KET. So to fully implement these service opportunities of next-gen TV, we are making some upgrades to our network center. Um, through a grant that was funded by the Kentucky Department of Education, we'll be able to replace end of life and failing equipment. Um, a lot of our infrastructure, it's uh, 10 and 15 years old. These are computer systems. You all know how that is. Um, a lot of risks with that and a, and a lot of uh, patching things together. And we're going to be able to replace this equipment. It helps us to ensure, ensure the technical reliability of our network center infrastructure. <laughs> it helps us to prepare for next gen TV to create that content um, and also will enable us, quite frankly, to continue to produce and distribute educational programs and services. Uh, this is equipment we use absolutely every single day to do the core services that we provide. It'll address our baseline broadcast infrastructure, our master control, our editing, and the supporting IT and facility systems. We're working on it now and the project extends uh, through 2024. So in conclusion, uh, I want to thank KDE Commissioner Glass and Associate Commissioner Dave Couch here for our longstanding partnership uh, and for KDE support and helping to make Next Gen TV possible right here in Kentucky. And I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you again for the opportunity to share. <laughs> I love sharing our work and um, enjoy the opportunity to talk to this group. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Always uh, great to, to work with you and the great things that, that KT has done um, before and now during 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 your time. So so thank you. I want to highlight a couple of things we're working on with KET. PBS Learning Media is a, a, a partnership we've had with them in different forums throughout the years. And year to date, uh, over four million resources were streamed in Kentucky, and that's an increase of 150 uh, percent over 2021. And these are for our schools. These are audio video clips that teachers use in instruction. And also the, the students can use those as well to show you the great jump in that news quiz. And Jeff, you're familiar with news quiz as we have uh, a participant in that, that that helps out with our STLP event. Um, you know, it's entered its 37th year, has 160,000 of our students and teachers uh, and was used by 118 school districts, um, um, the, the Kentucky school districts this past year. And uh, the PD effort that we have, the Take 12 PD effort year to date, 1,300 certificates have been issued in the areas and a couple of different areas through, through KT. And you can visit their labs there as well, the physics lab and their uh, virtual media lab. Uh, they do do work. We also have a partnership with them, uh, the Kentucky Online Learning Experience Collaborative that we are um, also an initiative of our two organizations that are working together. Um, for schools and AC support, you know, the educators provide high quality online, virtual, or remote instruction. And so it's a good, uh, been a good, good partnership. And Tim, thank you for, for joining us and um, appreciate you seeing you, seeing you soon. Thanks for working that in today.
Thank you so much. And Tim, you're welcome to stay on for the rest of it uh, if you want to. So uh, no, no worries here. I um, also want to, you know, a couple other partnerships I want to highlight. I've done it before. It's important to have, you know, good vendor partners uh, that work cooperative with you. I think all of you deal with, um, you know, my course of, of eight years in the U.S. Army and 30 years here at KDE, you, you, you recognize who, who's a good partner and who's not a good partner. Obviously, those that are uh, you know, undermine you going around you and working angles and um, stonewall and delaying. You know, that's 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 a really difficult thing. My my, my I'm fortunate really in my time is that's only that's far less than a handful that you run into that. But you all deal with it with generals and colonels and superintendents and whoever else who sees something shiny and they take off after it. And then you got to try to educate them on on what it is and the long term impacts of that. But we've had you know 99% really good partnerships and and that's something I think we've done well. If that's a superpower uh, that we have, I think that that's one of our our, our big superpowers is having uh, you know good relationships with a variety of organizations. And I last December I gave an example of that with DMD and Volta as being a great vendor partner. DMD recognized as we were transitioning from um, on-premise to cloud that that would really impact their service since they sold those devices and, and that were placed in schools for the financial management system. But Dave Savigny at, at that time, and now Marshall Butler, who leads that organization, uh, was also part of that. Recognized that was in the best interest of, of folks across the, you know, the, the state, and and they could have been working with districts and poisoning that and undermining that, and they didn't. Uh, they supported that, uh, and and really helped us with that implementation. And in and, and years later, obviously Volta has become an excellent partner of us and of, of KD, the agency, in doing that. Also, the partnership with school districts, I think, you know, nothing's 100 percent perfect, but uh, in comparison to the other 49 states, it's one of our superpowers as well. And I did want to give some background on um, Jefferson County and, and Fayette County, uh, as well as some other districts. And we we recognized early on and some folks that that uh, may not have even been uh, born at the time that um, some things I was talking about. Um, but, you know, it, it's not always been rosy. Um, and there's some things we've had to work on. Right now, I would say the partnership with Jefferson County Schools Ed Tech staff and Fayette County is outstanding. Um, um, and, and I appreciate that, uh, greet that great partnership that we uh, that we have uh, with those organizations. But if you go back in time, especially my first five years that um, I, I was an associate, it wasn't it wasn't so fine. Um, and you know. We had, and I want folks to understand this, is this very important that we have our same school districts, all school districts, especially our largest, largest ones, following our, our product standards uh, and doing the same things as our smaller ones. It's tough, it's tough to enforce it with your smaller ones if your larger ones are not doing that. And it's also from a financial point of view, your larger districts being part of what you can, you're doing significantly drive down costs for everyone across the state. And we, we saw that difference when we first started the KETS program of what people were paying before we went through and did statewide types of things. And definitely the, the mid to smaller size districts and rural areas were paying significantly more. The response rate was lower. And so having Jefferson County Public Schools and Fayette County Public Schools part of what we're doing is super important. And it's rare in the United States that your largest school districts are doing what the rest of the school district doing technology. In fact, I want to say Kentucky is the only one. It may be Hawaii, and Hawaii is one school district, so maybe they pulled it off as well. But you know, it's important that they do that. And we've had, of course, at the time, my early days, and and we had this with Jefferson County that they were not implementing, they did not want to implement certain product standards. Um, and there was a time we brought them before the Kentucky Board of Education every month because they were lagging behind. And the education technology and we even had an incident where they tried to break away and create their own uh, network component bid and, and implement that and that which was stopped um, but really and I, I you know i look forward you know to the folks i think about when mike razor's there now with kermit belcher the tremendous relationship we've had with that district um, in doing things it's really fun to work with them and the, the cool things that we're able to do together with the organizations given every organization has bureaucracy but when you have your largest ones and working with your DOE, you can really have have magical things uh, type of uh, happen, which we are having having happen. And so obviously we've had incidents of 
few other districts are trying to do some things, and but but I wanted that we we've we've uh, identified and, and and corrected. But I wanted folks to know is um, is everyone's walking and going down that same path in education technology, and it's important that we do that from just the cybersecurity that we're doing. Um, the is one district goes from one you know person goes from one district to the next. They're they're using the same type of system. Um, and just from the financial point of view, it's made a, it's a significant and overwhelming difference to Kentucky. So I always want to point out that great cooperation we've had with our districts. And, and to be honest with Fayette County, it's it's pretty much always been there. Um, in our earliest days, as they had a homegrown financial management system, we brought in Toyota, and along with the Toyota leadership and some other kind of folks we had there in Jefferson in, in, in Fayette County, a guy named uh, Darus Der, Marifat, which was a super cool guy. Uh, Darus is and still still is if you know Darush, talked about if a piece of software does 80% off the shelf, does 80% what you want to do, you really need to go with that and you change the other 20% of your processes. And that partnership we have with Toyota, with some folks in Fayette County Public Schools, uh, really led to Fayette County early on implementing uh, Munis. And so uh, we appreciate both those, those districts along with all the other ones. And by the way, Jefferson County only follows it. They're usually one of the very first ones to pilot things now. Uh, so we pre greatly appreciate uh, those in Je Jefferson County and Fayette County and those are making you know, really cool things happen in, uh, in our, our vendor partners as well. Want to share uh, share another vendor partner that we have, another partner, not a vendor partner, uh, with, uh, uh, let me bring this back up, where was that? With uh, the Kentucky High School Athletic Association. Uh, so before I, before I begin is, uh, you know, it's, it's the High School Athletic Association is led by uh, Commissioner Julian Tackett. And I would say Julian's much like I am. He's um, a technology ner nerd that loves uh, sports. Uh, and that's how I describe myself. And Julian, we're about the same age, uh, very close to the same age. And it's the same birthday. Um, and enjoyed working with Julian and his team over the years. Uh, Joan Golia leads the uh, eSports part that we'll be talking about today. Rob Catron is, is, does a lot of the technology things for that organization uh, that he's involved with. I know GoFan he's heavily involved with and, and some of the other parts that we'll be talking about uh, today. But I've appreciated our long partnership. It began um, really uh, with it, the school information system years ago. Um, there's a lot of, of things that uh, school districts use that school information school uh, for system that affect um, uh, students and then it's like their sports and so the other part that was natural that came after that was uh, parents being able to keep up with and students their athletic eligibility and so obviously with the infinite campus parent portal and student portal students and parents can now better keep up with are they uh, athletically eligible to play and allows uh, the coaches to keep up with that a whole lot better as well we mentioned, uh, you know, earlier some of these other types of technologies that use the that use bandwidth. I, I, I bring this up to the, this chart here to show you is um, we talked about earlier the the, the, the money making aspect of, of, of types of things. And so, the high school athletic association, just like your local sports budgets, have a budget that they're trying to fund so they can, you know, have sports in their organization. And there are some sports that bring in more revenue that help fund the other sports. Um, and so they're interested, you're interested in providing a lot of different options for, for students um, that are out there. Uh, but there are definitely some that bring in more than others. And this first column is uh, before the pandemic of 2018, 2019, 2017, and 2016. But it, the main teaching point here is not high school athletic association, but, but, but school sports in general is they're keeping up with numbers internally about, about money. And they have to because it's, it's paying for the field, it's paying for the equipment, it's paying for a variety of things, and there's income that comes into that that helps balance that, that's for sure. Uh, but this is definitely one of the things that every organization keeps up with, and you kind of can see the different sports that are out there um, uh, with what they bring in compared compared to other the other schools, and that, that allows some of the other sports uh, to, to actually uh, to, to exist. Uh, this shows participation. Uh, by, uh, if I get that slid up here, here. Um, so it shows you the different levels of different sports that are out there, you know, the, the, the kids that are participating in those, the number of teams. I think I'll just stop right there. Um, 
And um, if you take a look at this, there, there's um, you know, a different course of the year that's with esports in particular. If you take a look at that, it was really that's four different sports. So let's choose basketball. You don't have basketball uh, team one, two, three, and four of different kind of flavors of basketball. You don't have a three-on-three -three tournament. Um, you don't have a one-on-one -on -one tournament. You really have boys basketball. So, but esports is a little bit different to where, uh, like the last year, they had four different esports that that were played. And so that's a combination of all those the esport teams and the the students that are there. So you may have uh, a school that has uh, four uh, League of Legend teams and two Madden teams, and so that all adds up uh, it adds up there to to the numbers that you're seeing there. But that gives you a feel for uh, the number of of sport teams that are that are out there. And it's comparison to esports we're going to talk about here. So this was the enrollment that just happened with esports. Um, my understanding with talking with Joe Angolia that uh, PlayVS, who is the manager of esports and, and then provides the platform for esports to play for all the esports sanctioned games by the High School Athletic Association, uh, is, is PlayVS. And these are the games they offer uh, to students. And Joe, um, if you're listening in, or just text me or send me something of, of a, or I don't know if you joined or not, I sent you the link. So um, if I've said anything incorrect, uh, go ahead and and, and correct me on it. But these are the sports that PlayVS offered. Uh, there were two sports that uh, dropped off here, the uh, FIFA soccer and Smite, because there wasn't enough interest in it before, so they dropped that off as a potential option. So they give um, districts a chance to, to look at this. My always encourage PlayVS and the High School Athletic Association as well to test these out to really make sure they work over the Kentucky K-12 Internet Service before they're offered. Um, um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say that again, always, we're always trying to encourage them to do that. Uh, but if you take a look at the games played uh, last spring and winter, League of Legends, Rocket League, Madden, and the Smash Brothers uh, Ultimate. Uh, and that's a, that's a Nintendo game. Uh, League of Legends and Rocket League are played on a computer. Um, and then uh, Madden, I think, is play or PlayStation. Uh, and you can correct that. I think you can play those other things, but PlayStation is mainly what they played it on. So they're signing up, and uh, that has been extended by PlayVS. It was the 16th, I think Joe said it was this Wednesday, and we'll find out the numbers. In high school sports, if you go back up here, uh, typically in the past, and Joe and Rob and Julian for listening, is you had to have, I want to say it was 20, 15% of the eligible uh, members had to want that sport for it to be a high school athletic association sanctioned event, which means they had a state tournament. And maybe it's 15% now. Uh, that would be like 42, 45 schools was 50 schools at one time. Uh, but esports just has 20 teams, not schools, but teams as their as their threshold is what I understand talking uh, getting some input from Joe. And so We'll know, they'll know soon, uh, by Wednesday, which ones are at least have the minimum 20. It's anticipated the same four will be there. Uh, uh, the people signed up for those same four that were there previously. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll know we'll know soon there if there, this meets that threshold and we'll find out about that. Uh, these do take up, these are, you know, esports are video games. Um, and so obviously, the discussion we're having about you know the amount of bandwidth they take up is a real discussion. Um, if you do a Google search on anything about how much bandwidth is a typically sport, you can have minimal requirements, but then you have how much do they really want. So there, there's no latency and there's reliability. It's typically in esports, which is super important, is, is that you know really low latency uh, and uh, you know problems with latency and uh, it's a reliable source. And so even though there's, there's there's bandwidth requirements, typically you will see them you know, want much more than that. So if you take the number of that bandwidth per person on, on these teams, and you can have, let's say there's one school that has four, I think it was four League of Legends teams. Well, that means, you know, there's 16 of those. They may have a, a, a Rocket League team. And I know these are mainly played on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Is there some of these that are played on the same day? So you may have 20 students playing on the same day. So it goes back to that discussion. Uh, uh, we want prime time instructional hours to remain prime time for those teachers and staff doing, you know, school related activities. Um, because we know anything afterward that takes up a lot of bandwidth is something that really that really could impact what they're doing during the school day. Um, another uh, thing that has come up 
during the discussion is the start times. Um, and so we want to add some clarity to this. You can do a copy paste of this. From the Kentucky Department of Education perspective, we're fine with any esports game um, beginning anytime after 4 p.m. local time. Um, that's not, you know, it's as long as it begins after that time, uh, we don't really care about it. So, you know, an Eastern uh, time zone team playing the Eastern time zone team can start right at 4 p.m. A Central playing Central can start at 4 p.m. Uh, or at, in time afterward. Um, if they're not using, and we have private schools that are part of this, and we have Nintendo Switch obviously doesn't use the Kentucky K-12 internet service. Um, they can start at any time, you know, from KD's perspective. They can start before 4 p.m. or after 4 p.m. Uh, the problem comes into where you have an Eastern playing a Central time. So anytime, you know, we don't mind a game starting 4 p.m. Cent uh, Central time um, uh, if they're playing the Eastern team. The real the real issue that has come up with the 5 p.m. time frame is the play VS platform really does not have the flexibility to start at, at, at different times. Everybody's got to start at the same time. So um, they, they've had to pick, they, you know, so they picked 5 p.m. Uh, to start at. So even though people are, are you know, Eastern playing in Eastern and Central playing in Central and someone on the K-12 network, it really doesn't have the capability to, to allow those, much like other sports that are out there, the, the two schools can can talk between themselves at the stop time. So right now that platform with PlayVS doesn't allow that. So it's not a KDE um, thing that we're requiring every game to be started at 5 p.m. It really is but because of the, the PlayVS platform. Uh, this is also a link and I sent it to a superintendent yesterday was asking about it. So I know and, and to their CIO. Uh, this is the background if you can point people to about the Nintendo Switch. Um, uh, unlike the, the PlayStation and the computers, the, the Nintendo Switch doesn't have the capability of working over the Kentucky K-12 internet network. It requires a lot of things to be turned off from a cybersecurity perspective. And we've already talked about the importance of cybersecurity and the increased tax that we have. However, um, you know, those that are playing Nintendo Switch and they did in the uh, last uh, fall and spring, uh, they can continue to play that. They just got to find a location off the school campus or they get hot spots. As long as those aren't connecting way to the Kentucky K-12 Internet Network and they can play those on the school campus or beyond the school campus. But if you need to uh, um, point people to those, that's uh, that's a good place to point them to to kind of explain that. I know some of you have been put in that situation. I want to share with you the uh, the ticketing. I'll go through some of these as well. Um, the ticketing um, is if you're not familiar with it, a lot of schools are going toward ticketing and uh, this this is a, a convenience factor, but also it's a it's a money maker for obviously the company called Go GoFan, and it's a it's a go it's a money maker for school districts as well. Um, it's a different way to do tickets, and you know I went to the Whitford County football game uh, recently, and uh, they really didn't have a way to pay for cash. I mean you got to have the, the, you know the the uh, the GoFan application, and a lot of moving toward that where they don't have a cash option or, or it's a uh, very rare that they have that. So this is something that's going to be growing uh, just like esports. Esports is an area that is definitely going to be growing um, and there's definitely been growth every year and interest in that. And obviously you all as, as ed tech leaders that are managing bandwidth want to give some thought to you know, how many esports teams do you have um, that are running over the K-12 network and, and individuals on there and do you have enough capacity to do that um, or do you have to you know, size it so that it, you, you, you don't run into kind of kind of bandwidth problems there. Uh, this shows the postseason. It definitely shows the growth, and I'm just picking some different time frames there of um, the tickets that are sold. You can see the different sports, which I found pretty interesting, uh, that that use uh, the esports e uh, to sell in the postseason. And there's more of a, a, a cut of the money, as I remember, in the postseason for districts than the regular season. I think there's a difference in the sports. So I found it interesting. The regular season sports, who bought the most versus the, the postseason. That's the way you look at. You can see the number of schools that are using it. 99 in Kentucky. That's going to be growing. No doubt about it. Um, you can see the, the school districts that use it the most. This is another, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a user of this one as well. Um, uh, National Federation for High Schools um, offers a service, and it's a pretty cool service, that allows you to watch live sporting events um, and also allows you to watch ones that occurred that you didn't get to watch live or occurred a while back. 
uh, which I think is a cool um, thing to be able to do. It has a cost, so uh, this organization uh, makes money by it. Uh, other organizations make money by it. Uh, uh, by doing it, you can see there's a free cost to it. This is a great service, um, you know, for grandparents that can't be there, live in other part of state, or someone's ill that can't be there, or you can't be there at two places at the same time. For me, is the girls' state tournament. We were having, we were in the Kisti conference at the same time, so. In the evenings, I caught up with the, the girls basketball tournament by watching uh, the on demand and even the live broadcast of it. And then later on in the weekend, I watched the caught up on it and, and allows me to kind of actually before the boys state tournament, watch some of the regionals to kind of get familiar with those teams before they play in the state tournament. So it's a really good experience, really inexpensive cost to do that. I think it's well, well run. Um, the, the, the part that we would mention associated with this, you can see 44% of our schools are using that. And one of the things where this product, you know, this 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 touches both organizations is the use of our Kentucky K-12 internet service. Um, we are fine, obviously, with this service being used after core instructional hours, um, but we are we are not fine with it not you know being used uh, uh, before that time uh, because of once again the bandwidth it takes up, and then also we want to make sure the product goes instruction and also from an E-rate perspective that uh, we're, we're keeping that boundary uh, there with that service. But this is a really cool thing. If you've never done it, uh, it's, it's like I say, very inexpensive to you to utilize. And they, they've even up the capability for it to operate, uh, operate without, without a, a camera person. Uh, so if you're running short on staff and covering multiple events, it allows that to happen up front. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Huddle, if you're not familiar with it, this was the precursor or the predecessor to something called Dragonfly. And Dragonfly was a way, and I'm going to just take it back in time, is when I play, the reel-to-reels um, were exchanged, and it's it's kind of a curse you have between coaches. And when you got done playing a game, your reel-to-reel of that game went to the opposing coach of a future game. And they were permitted to kind of take a look at and get to the scouts without sending people there. Um, so the way this has changed is coaches can immediately upload because the, the games are being recorded digitally can immediately upload this and download this, uh, the games. And also the really cool thing about this, it allows players to kind of create their own profile uh, and highlight film for their friends and family to watch. And also, even though a very small percentage uh, will, will um, um, you know, get college scholarships for this, and it's kind of like anything else, uh, there's a small percentage to do that. It can help out with that for the small percentage that can get athletic scholarships. Uh, but this is also can take up a lot of video. And so, when Dragonfly was de de deployed, um, I recall, and, and Julian knows this, and staff is, uh, you know, we said now this would only be used after core instructional hours, and they all said we promise we do that. And so we took a look at the bandwidth, and um, I guess they thought that applied to everybody else except them. So we saw they were mainly used during core instructional hours because districts were complaining about slowness of the internet. And so when we inspected that, we saw that a lot had to do with the video being uploaded and downloaded. And so Cool thing about Huddle is you can download it during non-instructional hours. So those are available to the coaches. So we actually took a, a look at this as we do most things on the Kentucky K-12 internet network. We recently looked at this and saw that it is taking up a sliver of a sliver of a sliver. It's 1% of 1% of 1% of the bandwidth. So that, that's good news. It tells me that the coaches and folks using this are honoring not doing it during a certain that, 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 that prime and those prime instructional hours. No, oh, yeah, and that's my little still well, uh, with a still well here. So I'll pause there. I'll come out of that to see if we have uh, had any questions here, and I'll take a look at the ghost soapbox and anything because I want to pause here before I go into the still well award here. David, we do have um, several great uh, questions that have come in through Go Soapbox, okay. uh, as well as really great participation with the kind of poll questions that we've we've asked. We're we're above uh, 50 respondents in some of those as well, so that that's fantastic. It gives us great feedback. Yeah. And our staff, you know, will takes takes a look at those too. Yeah. Kind of go through there, All right? David, a couple a couple to call out um, on the the current topic uh, with our with our partnership with KHSAA. Um, a question regarding um, the additional esports sites that are required in order to participate both in practices, scrimmages, and games. Um, uh, Epic and Riot Games, for example, 
are they vetted? Um, I'm assuming that's by KHSAA for K-12 content appropriateness or data security is the question um, that was asked. Yeah, I, I don't know. Again, you know that that had to be them that respond. We don't we don't do that at OET or at KDE. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that would be a good question to be asked uh, answered. You know, and part of this I can ask them uh, and ask them to get back. You know, to yeah. folks. You know, I think Joe said he's on. I got to get a message from Joe said he's on. So Joe, you you can you can. You can just answer or answer later. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but you can answer. Mr. Couch, you got me. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, as, as part of the participation in eSports, we ask the designated rep to sign off if they're comfortable with the content of the games in order for their teams to compete. That's right. That's right. That's true. So thank you for reminding. So that and, and, and part of this, um, I should have known, is this is there was a requirement by the high schools to really understand the games that they were playing. Because to be honest with you, is most people aren't familiar with esports, and, and I would say anyone over 30, maybe 25, is not familiar with esports. And so, for the most part, they thought esports was Madden, and esports is not. There's some combat and fighting games involved with that. And so, a big part of that was does the superintendent principal understand this is a combat and fighting game, and the the, the weapons they choose, none of them would be allowed in a school building. Um, and are you comfortable with that? Are the parents comfortable? They really know what an esports is. And so we went through that step of understanding you know, folks really being aware of what that is and and still wanting to proceed forward with that. So uh, uh, so there is that process. Thanks, Joe, for reminding me of that. And I think there's that only a part of that. So I uh, uh, anything else that you saw bubble up here? I'm just going to look at the anything else I want to hit on before I know we're a little bit over time um, I, th I think that that specific answer goes to the, the one question about um, the software that's being used in competition uh, for state competitions uh, with inputting student and staff PII I, I think that that probably joins with that previous question but one one that just came in David was about uh, and I'm personally, I'm, I'm personally aware of this, and David, I think you are as well. Where um, some some bad actors are setting up um, like some co-hosting fake sites for the uh, NFHS events um, for watching live events. So they'll set those up through Facebook, and it's basically a phishing attack uh, yeah. to get folks to put their credit card information into. And that's I know nationally that is a um, that is a uh, huge concern and in a in a an area where bad actors are um, are tricking people um, a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I think that part you know we were talking about those parts. I think the the growth and it's been fun because I said being a technology geek and nerd and a sports person, it's been fun to. Uh, be part of all this with high school click association and, and watch these grow. These are all growing types of things. We're not going to get any smaller. We're just trying to stay stay ahead of ahead of them all in the, the right way to do it. So uh, I think for the most part we get, uh, especially with esports, what we found is that's not a traditional sport. But just like anything, anything that gets the students to um, connect and care about their grades, coming to class and connected to the school is a good thing. And so that's you know the folks that have that have pursued that um, definitely that's one of the top things that that we see in that um, going forward. And by the way, during the pandemic, for the most part, it's only sport that could keep on going on like it normally did. Uh, so it really that was pretty interesting too uh, that the esports continued on without really a without really a drop. A couple other quick things I want to hit upon you. And, and typically when we start the brand new school year, uh, this one's the longest one that we do, including along with the one we finish the school year with is uh, what's going to hope get off to a good good start to the to the school year um i think most most of it gone well we know with the flood flood districts and those we, we meet with those districts every thursday uh, and that may end soon just to get their feedback i do want to highlight that the really cool thing that we had uh, happen is from the technology aspect is these flooded districts were significantly um helped by surrounding districts around them in Eastern Kentucky and from other parts of Kentucky and Western Kentucky. So when they needed computers to replace the ones that have been flooded, even though they may have some others on the way or insurance pays for them, our district stepped up and did that. And it didn't really require any donations for computers to, to be received from outside K-12, which is a really cool type of thing. 
And so the other thing that we're, we're closely monitoring with those is those students that are in the campgrounds on, in trailers and campers is their ability to do uh, get to schoolwork. We know a incredibly low percentage of them would be full time remote instruction. They want to be in person, uh, which we understand, but they want the capabilities of getting to in instructional content after school hours, along with parents being able to text and email and, and to check the school Facebook page um, is, is important. The feedback we got from those, the superintendents, the flood impacted is really only one was uh, campgrounds impacted. It's Crockersville in Breathitt County. And so we are trying to make the emergency management people aware of hotspots don't work there, doesn't have towers. Can they get a satellite service there? Um, there's a variety of ones of service, just not the students, but the entire population of that of that area. And the last thing I want to hit on is the steel wall. I'm wearing my red suspenders um, out there. I hope you're having some fun with that. Bruce Lindsay, you sent me some uh, some pictures of, of folks that are uh, that are enjoying that. And I hope you do something similar that our Board of Education did um, in, in recognizing. Um, I'm going to show some pictures we took of our OET staff members that uh, were, were, were present. Um, um, of each giving them each one, uh, you know, an award and, and, and our board recognizing and mentioning the importance of of what the education technology folks did in districts and OET during the pandemic. Um, you know, to, to help out with that, I hope you have, you know, you, you do a proclamation, Marty, I think we've sent a pro proclamation has been provided, right? I think everyone's picked them up um, that we had here. This was a lot of fun uh, with, with our OET staff members who are, who are uh, awesome. You know, interesting enough is 97% uh, of these folks here were here the entire time during the pandemic um, in a K-12 capacity. And so we appreciate those 3% that came on uh, afterward that filled that role. And that's a you know, the picture of our you know, team that's right there. I hope you're, you know, doing something similar with your organization to recognize them uh, for, you know, for job well done. Doesn't come with money, it just, you know, just a you know, this this coin, this commemorative coin, I call it the Meritorious Service Medal uh, for the reasons I've shared before. Bruce, you had some fun things you did with it. You want to share any of those pictures that you sent? Yeah, well, actually, I don't have them available on, on my uh, computer at the moment. But, uh, yeah, we had our Region 2 CIO meeting last week, and uh, – I handed out the uh, awards to all the folks that were able to attend, and we had some fun uh, with it. Some uh, anytime, anytime Steve Gum attends a meeting, it's going to be fun. And so we can took bring those up. Can, can, I sent those messages to other part of the OIT staff. Can you bring? Can someone come and bring those up? <clears throat> share those. An email, let me see. Yeah, that's a fun thing to share. But I hope you, I hope you have some fun with it, and recognize your staff. Um, we're going to have a steel wall day later on. We're going to take those pictures. We're going to take uh, the names that we have. So we're going to have a list of folks that have received the medal in OAT. And also, obviously, we've asked our field staff to collect that from you. That will be on the Steelwell page. That will be there forever. Uh, recognize as, as helping people during the time. Yeah, there we go. Had to sneak Amy in. Yeah. Very, very professional looking there. Um, but, but we have some kind of interesting ones here coming up. There's Steve Gum. <laughs> yep. So we'll, uh, you know, as you're taking pictures of this and having some fun with it, um, we'll share those and and uh, make those available in the names available as folks as well that were part of it. So once again, want to thank those that joined today. Part, part, apologize for going over. As we had some a lot of good content to share, we want to have some great partnerships with these organizations, and wanted to share that with you. Hope that was helpful. Um, I'll be sticking around here for those that want to stick around in our after hour time, and I'll stick around here for you know five or ten more minutes for those that. Uh, oh, Julian, thank you for joining. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, thanks once again. Thanks, Julian. Mr. Tack, for your great partnership and leadership uh, all these years. Appreciate it. Um, so bonus time for anyone else that wants to stay around. Th those are watching KD Media Portal. Uh, thanks, we'll be dropping off. Those are our kids, partners, and, and co-ops, but I'll be hanging around here for a bit for those that want to hang around. So thanks. <laughs>